Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back for those of you who are rejoining us and welcome for those of you who are joining for the first time. I'm Afa Dworkin, President and Artistic Director for the Sphinx Organization, and it is a great pleasure and an honor for me to join uh, my colleagues here on a proverbial stage <laughs> in our Zoom land and, and really share some of their incredible stories and uh, the projects that they've conceived of and mounted and really obtained resources and funding for in order to, um, to help create new ideas, new projects, and new work in the sphere of DEI, um, particularly as it relates to classical music. We were so excited this year to have received an incredibly large and diverse, no pun intended, array of applications. And these four stood out through their innovation, excellence, and really boldness of ideas. So what we will do together today is we will talk a little about Sphinx Venture Fund and, and really the ethos and the purpose behind this opportunity and then the program that Sphinx mounted a while ago. And the rest of the time I'd love to really spend yielding to these artists to talk about why um, these projects felt relevant and important, how they came about, and then ways in which really audiences um, and delegates from all around the world can learn more, become involved, and or also be emboldened to, emboldened to apply and try um, and try their hand in, in really uh, participating in this way in the future as well. So the Sphinx Venture Fund, in short, is one of our most significant granting programs. The idea behind Sphinx Venture Fund is inspired by Sphinx's longtime belief that change in the sphere of equity, diversity, and inclusion cannot be accomplished by a singular person, artist, or an organization, but in fact comes from innovation, creativity, zeal, and persistence of other people and other organizations. So this was our way to really empower, encourage, and sometimes impel um, the field to lead that change. And, and often we talk about how Sphinx Venture Fund is really different than any other granting program of ours. Sphinx Venture Fund is designed to empower artists at the same time as it's designed to empower organizations. The idea here is not replication of other successful programs in the sphere of DNI. It's not about making a program that exists bigger and better. It is about new ideas, groundbreaking approach to change. It's about filling a space and a void and really stepping in and leading in a way that we have not been able to lead in the past. So it really capitalizes on that newness and the groundbreaking piece, uh, which is why when assessing the applicant pool and the vast array of applications this year, our national committee was really looking for how is it that we're breaking boundaries and which artists slash organizations have been able to either conceive of ideas, constructs, or partnerships that will do what has not been done before so that we can see our field begin evolving in this sphere of DNI and so that we can really see lasting systemic scale-like change rather than incremental change, which are more of the examples we've seen in the past. So we're just so excited that this year um, innovation was through the roof and we're incredibly excited um, to learn more about these projects, share these stories, and also um, hopefully inspire some visioning and collaboration amongst our delegates and audience members. So with that in mind, I will turn to my colleagues and ask them to talk a little about um, each of their projects and share um, their dreams with the audience. Darrell, I wonder if, if I'll toss it first to you, um, if you could talk a little bit about this project of yours and, and maybe capitalize on why was it important to you today, particularly in this time period? Absolutely. So my project is called Scoring for Equity in Opera, and it's a project through the Black Opera Alliance for which I am on the leadership council. And, you know, I'll answer your, your, your second question first and that it's important now, not only because of Black Lives Matter movement and our, our realignment with what racial justice looks like, but because in the opera world, it's, it's long overdue. We are way behind and it's really gonna take some interventionist um, advocacy for this EDI work in order for us to catch up even. Um, and, and so that's really the framework from which I 
came to this, this project. And, and what the project does is it not only creates a framework by which we are created, we are getting data from opera companies of which there are about 130 or so, <laughs> um, most of uh, which are, are member companies of Opera America, but there are also some companies who are not members of Opera America. And we're gonna get survey data from them and then we're gonna report to the field on where, the, where our industry stands equity wise. And then throughout the year while we're doing equity round tables as well as engaging with colleagues around our pledge for racial equity and systemic change, we will create quarterly insight reports and just let folks know what's going on. All of these, these statements that people are putting on their websites about you know, their, their, their alignment with the Black Lives Matter movement, we're going to have them put their money and their policy where their mouths are, and we're going to track that. And, and that tracking is not only gonna be important to us in 2021, but it's going to be a grounding for how we start here and move forward. And I, I think, you know, as, as terrible, especially as artists and performing artists, as the pandemic has been in terms of performance, it has given us an opportunity to breathe to rethink what we're doing. And as far as I'm concerned, I think we need this time for recalibration um, because moving forward, I think the work that we're doing is really going to be groundbreaking in the opera industry. Absolutely. It is so exciting um, to be able to have that um, as a methodology and a tool that will hopefully empower the, the sector to do the work that's been overdue. You, as you, as you said the word overdue, it, there's a chilling quality to that. Can you maybe get into a bit of, and I know we could dedicate a session to just that next nuance of the conversation, but why would you say, why are we so overdue with this work? And I like to ask twofold questions. Why are we so overdue? And what do you think, what gives you hope in terms of the field recognizing that overdueness? Um, why are you hopeful today? Well, I'm gonna ask your first question because I, I have to decide while I'm answering whether I am hopeful, um, knowing what I know about where we stand currently. Um, it, it's overdue because for example, we have two black general directors of major companies, one of whom is very recent and we have zero black artistic directors of major companies. And, and keep in mind, this is an opera field that is making hundreds of thousands of dollars on the backs of black people, on the stories of black people. Porgy and Bess brought the Met out, <laughs> out of a, a very financially troubling time. And, and every company, every major company is doing a, a Porgy and Bess or a this or that every several years because they know it brings in the audiences. And, and you know, that really is the thing. What the scholarship tells us is that these diverse shows bring in new audiences, bring in younger audiences, more diverse audiences. The scholarship also tells us that when you diversify your boards, there is more idea creation, there's a greater diversity of thought, there's a greater a bit of inclusivity that you're creating. And finally, also when you diversify your administrative staffs, the scholarship tells us that even if the environment is uncomfortable at first, the productivity is always greater just because of the diversity alone. And so knowing all of those things and still being at a place where our industry is so overwhelmingly white tells us that there is a, a huge problem of white supremacist culture we're having to deal with. And so what makes me hopeful, organizations like mine, organizations similar to mine with my Latinx colleagues, other organizations like Middle Class Artists, there's this Soloist Coalition Young Artists Forum that are, that are doing good work. There are a lot of grassroots organizations that are holding our industry to the fire. And now that everyone's on their computer and they're forced to be at home on Zoom meetings all day, if we can use social media, we can use our websites, we can use Instagram, but no matter what, I promise you that by the time we come out of this pandemic, the Black Opera Alliance is going to be known as one of the agents of real systemic change in this industry, come hell or high water. Awesome. I can't wait. Now, for those listening, 
there could be future casting directors, artistic planning directors, there could be folks in and outside of the opera world. There are most undoubtedly incredible artists in, in the audience, I know there are, and those who seek to really find a place uh, on the administrative side. Um, there's just so much incredible talent, of course, I don't have to be the one to tell you, but how do you, I guess, again, a twofold question, what can others do to be an advocate for this project, to draw attention to it? And what can other organizations do to become involved and really learn and understand more about how this work that you're doing can help them evolve and become more relevant? I love that question so much. The first thing you do is you go to www.change.org backslash equity and opera now and you sign our pledge we'll read it first and if you agree and i hope you do sign our pledge the next thing you do if you are a black person then please join our black opera alliance facebook group on uh facebook if you are a non-black person please follow our page on on facebook uh, and on instagram if you are a funding organization we still need funds this thing sprint is was absolutely groundbreaking. We're already like 500 times higher and more relevant than we were um, just by the resource that uh, the resources that we were able to get through the grant making, but I mean through the grant, but going forward, we have so many ideas. We have a membership that's pushing about a thousand of our several platforms now. And there are many ideas, not only outward facing, but internally, there's a lot of community building happening. There's a lot of community support happening, building each other up, and we can use support in that, whether it's financially, whether it's getting the word out about who we are, please follow the work that we're doing. And when the time comes and it's coming in the next several months, and this, if, if you are an opera general director, you haven't signed the pledge, I'm telling you the work is coming in the next several months, all of those accountability mechanisms will be very public facing. And so once you see that, if you are an advocate, if you are someone who pushes and are a warrior for racial justice, then make sure you amplify our messaging, amplify the work that we're doing. It is a mighty work, but we need all of the soldiers on the field in order to get it to the next level. That's, that's so great. You know, in many ways, this resonates so strongly and beautifully with last night's opening address when Elizabeth Alexander told us that there's no unity without accountability, right? So, in addition to it being a beautiful statement, it's also so very true, and that might have been what's missing, and a missing ingredient in so much of the work that's been done in the DEI sphere. So, so, so really tapping into that accountability piece is, is a place where Sphinx hopes to not speak on behalf of, but amplify the voices of BIPOC artists. Absolutely. Um, black and brown artists. So this is so exciting. And, and the last question for you for the time being, if you close your eyes and you imagine the work and the potential impact of this project, um, what is the vision? If it's successful, where are we in say a year or three years? You know, well, the first thing I will say is I don't have to close my eyes because it's going to happen we will be successful. And what the success is going to look like is we're going to have a benchmark of where we stand as an industry. And I think as an organization, um, you, you talk about accountability, you know, one of the most insidious problems we have is that the folks who are at the very top making the decisions, there are not, a, there's not enough diversity there, there's not enough diversity on our boards, there's not enough diversity in our, our management team, on our management teams and our, our folks who are looking for talent, all of these different areas of what make the, makes the industry the industry, there's not enough. And there a lot of those areas are behind closed doors making these decisions until you never see it. And so that sort of success in a year from now, in three years from now, a lot of that will become a lot more public. Postings for general director positions, executive director positions, artistic director positions, board openings, all of these things will become a lot more public. We will create new strategies for, for how to engage diverse communities and understanding that the only prohibitive factor is not money, that there are millionaires and billionaires who are black and brown, but if your mission statement does not match your actions, they are not going to join your organization. And so we have to change our thinking from this, this 
you know, this full business within the non non for profit sector and really change it to what it's supposed to be for the folk. This is what we are for. We are community organizations meant to produce content, meant to uplift our communities, meant to reflect our communities. And when we start doing that, I will know our work has been successful. Absolutely. Well, we look forward to it. I, I am incredibly just moved and inspired by your vision. And it's certainly our honor to be in partnership with you and help empower and support your vision. So thank you. And I am deeply, deeply grateful to the Sphinx organization, not only for the grant, but for what I know is going to be just a beautiful love affair moving forward. Thank you. Awesome. Absolutely. There's so much potential there in the opera world. We look forward to it. Great. I'd love to, um, I'd love to come to Siad next. Siad, welcome and thank you so much for your vision and your hard work in putting together that dream and, and that proposal. And really, I wondered if you might share um, a bit more with the audiences about the inspiration behind um, not just this newest initiative, but maybe the inspiration behind the founding of the database and kind of the, the broader vision that it that, that's there. Yes, uh, thank you so much for, for having me here today, for supporting the Institute for Composer Diversity. We, of course, really, really appreciate it. Um, and we appreciate your vote of confidence in our work. The Institute for Composer Diversity started out, I want to say in about 2013, as a spreadsheet where composers were listed who were from historically underrepresented groups. I believe the initial focus was on women composers. And so you could go to this spreadsheet and you could see all of these women composers and you could learn about their work and hopefully program them. And then as time passed on, the call and the need for diversity in programming at a larger scale uh, became more important. And so the resource became what it is today, which is a research tool that allows users to find works from historically underrepresented composers of all instruments. So anyone can go there, they can say, hey, I would like to find a work by a black composer for wind band. They can go, they can put in those search terms and then they can use that to help them find a piece that they might be looking for. So that was the original inspiration for the pro for the database, and that is what it is now. Absolutely. Can you talk a little more about the vision then with this newest approach and in the initiative? Where do you see, what's it tackling, and what do you see it doing if it's successful? Yes, I say that the vision for this project now is to be an even bigger resource for people. Right now, we have a resource that has a lot of works for large ensembles, but we are hoping to really expand that to all of the instruments. So I myself am a guitar player, and I hope that one day, very soon, that the ICD website will have solo works for guitar by composers who are underrepresented uh, historically. And so that is the vision. And so what we're hoping to do with our project is to expand our database to be able to do that, to have resources to, to be able to do that. And in the second phase of our project, our hope is to really impact and transform our audiences. The people who, again, are coming to our concerts, who are invested in our work, who are buying tickets, who are stakeholders in our communities, we are hoping that they begin to hear themselves and see themselves and, and to be able to understand themselves on all of the concerts that they might attend in their communities, whether it be from large ensembles to individual artists who are doing this work. So that is our hope with our initiative moving forward. <laughs> Absolutely. So if I am, um, if I'm a composer, and in fact, I have access to other colleagues and composers and, and know a lot of, and, you know, have a whole family of composers who are either like-minded like or, or specifically composers of color who, who's no, whose work is not yet known. How do I contribute? How do I become involved? How do I, how do I become included? 
Yes. So you can go to composerdiversity.com and you can submit your own works into the database and they're there for people to find. So we don't, we, we hope that whenever someone is using the database, they do their due diligence to research a lot of the composers and to find out a lot about them. Whenever someone does search the database, the results are randomized. So we can't make any guarantees about who will see, who will see your work, but we can promise you that people will be able to find your work in our database. So you can go there, you can submit your works, you can submit the work of your colleagues in our database and through a process of consent, then they will then appear. So it's really just a tool that the more that people contribute, the better that it will become. Of course, we do have research associates and assistants who are working to also locate the work of these composers so that they don't have to carry that burden themselves. But we are trying to tackle it from both ways. Absolutely. So that's one way that composers themselves can be involved. And I think, again, our, our end users for the database are typically administrators, educators, people in decision-making roles with their organizations who can say, I would like to find a work I would like to begin researching. I would like to learn more about composers. So I'm going to start here with this tool. And hopefully, if we don't have what you're looking for, we know someone <laughs> who might have what you're looking for, and they can assist you as you need. Absolutely. So you kind of very much answered my next question, which is that we've called upon colleagues and friends, and I know they're listening now and probably um, wondering if this could be a helpful thing. Um, we've called upon colleagues and friends to reimagine their seasons in a way that reflects our communities. Um, Sphinx has said, you know, have a minimum of 15% of your program season be reflective of non-white composers, specifically black and brown composers. And sometimes a question I get where do I start? So this is a place you start right now. And hopefully this is a place you not only start, but it, in fact, it becomes a place that you go to consistently as you build your programming, as you reimagine and evolve your artistic mission so that um, we can eventually gradually and hopefully completely um, do away with the statement that the works are just not out there, that access is limited, that critical editions aren't there, et cetera. I think uh, maybe it's fair to say that the ethos of this project and, and its expansion, its scale is to really shift um, is to change the access to aggregate this incredible material that absolutely does exist, but also to empower the field to make it easier um, to be able to actually practice what we preach and move past our solidarity statements. Yes, exactly. I, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought up the myth because I oftentimes find myself in conversations where people are saying, oh, um, does, does a piece by a Black composer for guitar exist? And, you know, my answer is, Yes, yes, it does. And so there, the works exist, the people are out there, the composers, the artists, uh, they're out there and their work deserves the same recognition and attention as white composers have for a very, very long time. And so we, we wanna balance the scales a little bit. I don't think that anyone is really calling for there to be no white composers on concert programs, but we are advocating for the inclusion of more black, brown, indigenous people of color to be on our programs. And that starts with finding about their works, that, that starts with paying them for, for their work and really committing to them for a long sustained period of time. Absolutely. So we're, we're talking about a long term commitment. We're talking about creating a resource and fortifying it and making it as accessible as possible and, and really working collaboratively with the field to to shed light upon what's always been there, but maybe hasn't been aggregated 
and put in one place. I always caution uh, my colleagues and students to not, um, not use the word discover. Um, we don't want the Columbus effect. We're not discovering something that's already been there for a long time. So we're just shedding light and amplifying what's what's been there. So, so I love that. And of course, for my programmer friends um, who, like I do, very much love to program and love to explore living composers and um, are really ready to double down and program in a way that's representative and inclusive, get in touch with SIAD uh, and, and check out the Diverse Composers database and, and please ask challenging questions and, and really have the courage to delve into um, this literature that's out there. So yeah, and I just wanted to add, you know, the second part of our program, our, of our, uh, yeah, our venture fund is to work with institutions and organizations of all sizes who are interested in getting some help to do more diverse programming. So reach out to me, we can work with a partner. We are looking for consultants, so people who will work on behalf of ICD with these partnering organizations to help them in the best way possible. Because I know that a lot of people say that it is a challenge to do this work and whether or not I agree is not the point, but we just want to make it uh, as easy and as accessible as it possibly can be. Because this is important work. Um, this is work that we should be committed to doing for a long period of time. And we want to help make sure that you're able to do so. Awesome. That's, that's terrific. That's, that's really, really critical because that artistic planning piece is actually um, a fascinating process where I think we all could collaborate more. So thank you so much, Siad, for that and for your leadership on, on the project. Hillary, I'd love to turn to you as a fellow string player. I'd love to um, spend the next portion of our time hearing a little bit about your project, what it is, and maybe hearing you share what inspired you to put this idea forward. Sure. Um, so I, this, for me, this was a long time coming, honestly. I, I really believe that uh, representation matters. And it matters at all stages of education for music. It's not just at the professional level in the orchestras having performances, but it needs to be included in the teaching studio from through college and younger for the when they first begin. I think even in those beginning orchestra concerts, when you imagine the families watching their little kids, you know, struggling through their string literature and don't know how to hold their bow yet, I think they need to see performances that are is more reflective of the world that we live in. Um, so this project came about trying to, as, as some of your other colleagues that have been mentioning here, trying to make it easier for educators and for teachers and for performers to include this from all, all, all sides and all levels. So what we are hoping to do is we're working on um, from beginning to advanced levels, creating a, a graded anthology. So we will have a beginning level series, we will have an intermediate level series and an advanced level series of repertoire that has been collected from throughout time because um, as, as we were just hearing, yes, there was music that was written by people of color. And like, I, I'm, I'm a violist, so I know this like from the many sides of this, right? I get this question of, of statements all the time that there is no music for viola. And no, actually there's a ton out there and even by people of color as well, there is stuff out there. So um, helping, but I also understand as a teacher, it's hard sometimes to find the time to go and, and do the research. And then you, let's say you find a piece or you find a composer, but you have no idea, you can't get the music without purchasing it. And you might not know what the level is. Is it appropriate for my student? Is it appropriate for this person? And so we want to create a place that people can go to. So that here is a collection of music for ASTA grade levels one through two, and it is for violin and piano. And then here's one for viola and piano. And for, we have it for all the string instruments with piano accompaniment, as well as a string ensemble so that orchestra directors can use it right in their beginning teaching right away. Um, and we are also including, we're trying to represent from all, all throughout time as best we can. So we are commissioning some new works as well to include in these you know, beginning, beginning volumes. Right now with this funds, we are focusing on the beginning level, but we are, already at work trying to get the intermediate stuff together and advanced um, in those two levels, we will be including chamber music as well. Absolutely, that's that's fantastic. And, and the teaching artist in me has been dreaming of something like this for a long time. So of course, I'm sure this is inspiring 
many teachers across the world, the country to, to really be able to get access to, to this incredible anthology and be able to actually practice what it is that we've been preaching for a while, that representation matters, there's been works, etc. So what I wondered is, um, how do you, um, as you work on these beginning levels and, and bidding, begin, assembling beginning volumes, um, how does one, where do you think you need the most amount of help? Who can most contribute to making this program, this project, a success in its early phase? Well, um, right now, oh, there's oh, there's so many ways. Uh, okay, um, if you are a professional and a performer, um, please get in touch with me. So um, you can reach me at the email address celebrate diverse strings um, at utk.edu. It's in my information on the speaker session, I understand, and also the web page. So. Um, because we we are also looking to record these and we are be looking for people to, to record them, especially if you are from these demographics, right? Like, um, well, I would love to go and record them all. I think it would be more appropriate to have somebody who is from the demographics represented in the books. So if you are one of these people that are interested, please send me a note. Um, if you have a piece that you would like to be considered, um, you can send that to us as well. Um, we will be sending a call for score out next week. Actually, it'll be on the um, newmusicengine.com. Um, we have prize money for that. It, it's unusual, right? Because it's, we're, we're focusing on beginning levels. So there's going to be very strict parameters that we are finalizing this weekend putting up. So it's like, will explain exactly what first position in D major is on viola. So that if you don't know, you can still write and be considered for this. Um, if, if we, you know, money is always helpful. <laughs> if you have pieces that you know of that were already in the history, please help. Or if you wanna serve in an advisory role, because we, we are in the final selections of narrowing down about to about 30 pieces. Um, and we will be sending out invitations in the next week as well to ask people for just input, make sure we didn't overlook something really obvious that we missed or that you know of something that should be included. So those are all ways that could be um, involved. Absolutely. Hillary, can you talk a little about um, involvement of advisors, teaching artists and scholars um, of BIPOC background who have been instrumental to your visioning of this, um, either as advisors or in other capacities? Uh, well, that's where we're, we're reaching out now to try and get, get more involvement. We started with, um, boy, just doing lots of scouring and searching and finding uh, from data and trying to put a database together. And it became, um, we, I'll have to be in touch with Siad because I actually have a database that I've started for strings that just became, I mean, it's 3,000 names long. And we had, we were devoting um, several semesters of all of our GTA hours, like looking in and researching and finding pieces and finding copies of scores and what interlibrary loan. Um, so we'll have to, we'll have to connect later. <laughs> but um, it became just so overwhelming because there, again, that myth, there is tons of stuff out there. It became more about finding what is going to be appropriate for, let's focus on the beginning level first. So finding things that would, you know, at that level, a lot of those things are ending up being, it was originally for piano and we're going to simplify it for violin and piano, right? So we've been doing a lot of looking of what, um, what what are the the performers and and composers from throughout the eras making sure we get a nice representation of of latinx and black composers and from different eras and women included in this mix as well so that already just kind of narrowed it down to have representation here of what could be used some pieces were just too advanced to be considered even in a simplified form it was going to be too much for this type of work at the beginning so um, we have been doing that and now we want to be getting more insight and searching for those people that you you are asking about absolutely well hopefully sphinx can and I, and I love seeing the synergies already even on the panel it's beautiful when <laughs> when these visions come together because we can really help fortify one another's projects and make it that much more informed um, and, and also just accessible so i love that already and hopefully sphinx can also serve as a conduit is one of the wonderful things here is that the database of teaching artists and, and string professionals is vast. And, and of course, um, I can think of so many artists who have dedicated their livelihoods to nurturing that next generation of artists and, and for whom this um, pedagogical material is going to be absolutely invaluable. So that's a place where we can 
um, hopefully also help make some connections. Thank you so much, Hilary. I'm, I'm so excited to see this happen and, and really begin to learn how your work is. May I share one more thing real quick? I forgot to mention a large portion of the funding from Sphinx is to actually get these books in the hands of educators out there. So we are gonna be sending 300 copies of these, printing them and sending them free of charge to people all over the country. So that's another way if you are interested in being involved in receiving one of those, please send us a message. We've, we've earmarked most of those for specific programs for universities and for Elsa STEMA programs and for string projects. But we do have a handful that were left up for uh, schools, specific individual schools to request a copy. So please let me know. That's terrific. That's wonderful. So access is also being considered. And I think that's ultimately that dissemination piece is so important. So that's that's great. Lara, I'm turning to you last, but by no means least. For, for us, kind of reading about The Rising Sun as a project was not only so moving and groundbreaking, but also so special because it's so personal. Um, I wonder if you could talk a little about maybe the process of visioning where it started and why, why Rising Sun now? Why is it important now to you? Mm -hmm. First of all, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. It's so wonderful to hear about all of this work and so grateful to you for making it all possible. And I love all the ways that it's all coming together. You're right, this is such a personal project for me. And it's a project that goes back, you know, a long ways in my work and my career. Um, I think I'll start with the second part of your question. I think now is the time because I've done all this work and, you know, once you've done a certain amount of really hard work and you see where it can go, then the um, support and the potential of a grant like this lets you do something transformative. The groundwork has to be done first and I've done it. And um, just you know, quickly, this is an initiative that's dedicated to re releasing recordings of music by black composers. Going back about 200 years, into the present day in a sort of an ongoing digital stream. I think that the experiences that I've had myself as an artist researching, advocating for performing, recording this music um, have given me an awareness, A, of how much of it there is, B, how easy, how relatively easy it is to retell the story of, you know, whatever we want to call it, concert music, American classical music, by filling in the blanks, by filling in the missing information. And I have done that successfully as you know an individual, and I wanted to try to build a community around that effort. Um, a few things have happened in the last year that made me really feel like this is the time. For one thing, I've been recording you know, music by Black composers in, in sort of big picture projects for many years. Um, this past year, I have been working closely with a musicologist named Michael Cooper, who um, is at Southwestern University in Texas, who was inspired by a recording of mine of the first um, Florence Price fantasy from years ago to go down to the University of Arkansas, go through those boxes that we know are there and start excavating the piano music. Um, he was eventually connected with Shermer, who had just acquired that catalog. And so Michael has been editing the entire Florence Price catalog. And I wanted to do a recording to really celebrate all of these, um, let's not call them discoveries, let's call them uncoveries, I don't know, right? <laughs> revealings. Um, I took that project to the three major labels and nobody believed in that project. So mm -hmm. I pulled together my loose change and just went and recorded the music and put it out digitally without actually honestly too much fanfare. And I've never, had a response from the wide world like I've had from that project. A, it was commercially very successful. B, numerous times every week, I'm hearing from listeners who hear this music on radio, on streaming services, who make the effort to reach out to me via social media, via my website to ask, where can I get this music? To just talk about what it means and how beautiful it is. And that really made me sit down and think, you know, about what what we expect and what can come and surprise us, that emotional um, reaction to this music. The other thing that happened was that I was asked to speak for the annual public radio program directors meeting earlier uh, last year. And um, I was asked to speak about diversity and programming. And you know, my approach to this is 
you don't check boxes, you rethink mm -hmm. the story that you're telling, who you're telling it to, you rethink your sound, your whole world. And we had this really wonderful, lively conversation. And there is such a welcoming to these ideas now. There's such a door open. But what came back to me was we can't shift the balance effectively because the recordings aren't there. And that's true and that's fair. And I know, and we all know how hard we have had to work over the years to A, find the music, to B, sort of represent the music. You know, it's it really has been exhilarating and exhausting work. So I think that this project, this infusion of new recordings of music that hasn't been heard before will have such a quick effect in shifting that balance. Every month, starting next week, starting next, yeah, beginning of February, an, an EP, basically a track a week going out to radio stations all over the country, all over the world, to the streaming services. Every month, your library is increasing exponentially and you can easily shift that balance and that changes what people hear all over the world. Long answer. <laughs> no, there's so much there. It, it is beautiful. It, I mean, to me, there are themes of everything. Now the relevancy piece. I think also another thing that comes through that hopefully a lot of our listeners are taking away is the importance of that hard work. There's like no substitution <laughs> as if you do have to dig through the boxes and if you're really committed, the music is there. So maybe it's not discovery, but maybe it's shedding light upon and then just, you know, illuminating what what is new to you and what you feel is important to the world and, and then also I think that incredible zeal and creativity you know I think I hear Lara thinking about how do I get this in front of and heard in front of people and heard so really releasing it to the radio and making it accessible not having it be a scholarly project that someone will discover 20 years from now how is it heard today so mm -hmm. that that courage to dream is what I think the venture fund is all about to hopefully empower um, that plan that action Lara could you talk maybe a little about in your mind what role do recordings play in evolving our canon and why is that important in the first place? I mean, our, our world is a world of sound. It's what we hear and that's what we fall in love with. So we can know things. We can see names on a page. We can, you know, read history books. But when we hear something is when we feel it and when we share it and when it becomes part of our our consciousness and, you know, sort of the air that we breathe. And, you know, one of the things that we've been thinking about and talking about recently, these new, these new stories that have come to light, these composers that we're just starting to get to know, you know, they, they don't have the same, um, the same, um, that's the word I'm looking for. The, the, the architecture around them is not the same as around a Mozart and a Beethoven. Why? Just because they're newer to us, but we need to build that up. We need to um, change the sort of the difference in, in the size of the figures, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I think that one of the pieces to that is the, the general narrative that until now has been prevalent that, you know, the story about a Florence Price, the story about a William Grant Still is always, she was the first and he was the only. That's always the story. And that's not the story about Mozart and Beethoven. The story about Mo Mozart and Beethoven is that they are part of this grand tradition. Sure. We need to understand that Florence Price and William Grant still are equally part of a tradition and that that tradition is equally as important and you know wonderful and, and essential to our lives that we live today. And I think that that's something that this series will, will illuminate really quickly. Um, you know, how the, the richness of that tradition, the breadth of it, how much it touches and pulls other things together. And at that point, that's when the canon changes, when we don't have these, this, this idea that they're these isolated figures that pop up here and there, but instead we see the tapestry that it is. Absolutely. And as folks are listening, in your mind, as somebody who conceived of the idea and is really constantly evolving what it means and how big its scale is, what do you want um, what would you want other serious labels, music institutions, presenting houses to do? What do you think is the most important thing for them to hear from you about this project? Well, A, they're already doing it. And this started as a very, you know, one man band project. And it has in the last few months, you know, developed into a beautiful community of partnerships. Um, one of the most 
one of one of the things I'm the most excited about is a partnership with Theodore Presser, um, who will be releasing a series of editions called the Rising Sun series. You know, taking these pieces that are being uncovered and making them available to the listening public. Um, so we were we're uh, partnering with presenting institutions. I think the first the first live show, uh, first live concert of the Rising Sun project is scheduled for uh, Ravinia this fall, September. Um, and we're looking at, you know, tours for the next few seasons and really having a lot of wonderful conversations with presenters about that. Um, the, there are, there's this roster of incredible artists associated with, with the project, everyone from Regina Carter to um, Sphinx family members, Devon Tynes, Titus Underwood, so many alums. We're, we're working with, of course, closely with Sphinx and also with young concert artists and Concert Artists Guild was from the top. Um, it's so much about the next generation for me and, and encouraging younger artists to take this repertoire as their own and run with it. Um, we have two things. If you go to risingsunmusic.org, there's a contact form and there's a donate button and you can use both of those things. And I think that for me, um, the next step is for inreach to start happening. We're doing a lot of outreach. I would love to hear from presenting organizations. I would love to hear from artists and ensembles who have projects. I would love to hear directly from composers. This project is just growing all the time because the more you know, the more you know. <laughs> so it's stretching kind of into the indefinite future at this point. Um, one thing that I'm really curious about are recordings that are being generated this year in this time of virtual performance, our orchestra is creating um, recordings of works by Black composers as part of their seasons this year that they would like to have distributed as part of the Rising Sun series. Um, I would love to hear also from scholars who are working on projects. I don't know everything and I can use all the support possible in, you know, learning more and sort of, and, and like connecting the dots, you know, because I think that that's the important thing. And particularly the community of educators, I would really like to amplify everything that we can do in terms of just getting this music into the hands of the teachers and the students and changing what student recitals sound like really soon. So this is so incredible. It, there, there's room there. There's nearly 2000 people joining us at Sphinx Connect. So I have to think that that um, such a large community is thinking about how to get involved in all these projects and all of these projects really, and take part, whether you're amplifying, whether you are sharing the news with someone who's not attending, whether you're contributing, my funder friends, this is a great way to amplify and double down and partner, but just so moved by the innovation and the courage that it took all four of you. And I know it doesn't just take four people, it takes then, the community within a tribe and, and partners and colleagues, but it takes a village and, and the village is here. So it's just really incredible. Here in a few remaining moments, I'd love to move to the questions portion from the audience. And I know there are, there are a number of them lined up. Um, I'll address the first one directly. There is a person applying with, uh, with a question about applying for funds for a string scholarship program. Um, I will say that, that in roughest terms, probably the best thing to do is to go to Sphinx Venture Fund um, website, web page itself, and it talks there about eligibility and, um, and programs for which you might want to conceive ideas. And that'll help you answer questions. And if FAQs don't do that, please drop us a line and we'll, we'll help with that as well. There's a specific question there. Um, does the composer diversity database have geographical tags for a location of composers? See how that one's for you. Yes, the composer diversity database does have geographical and location tags for composers. They, I believe are, I know down to the state, the individual states that composers live in. I'm not sure about the city quite yet. Um, and we wanna make sure that we are helping composers to stay safe and, and, and everything. So that's why we may not have the city for, for everyone, but we, we for composers who, would, who wanted to be tagged um, by their city or you know, country of residence where they live, uh, or birthplace, they are tagged in the database. Awesome, absolutely. Um, that's great. And then another question actually also is for um, for ICD. And there, someone's inquiring about the best practices you might, you might have for your research assistants uh, when they're cataloging multiple identities, particularly um, identifications of sexual and gender identity. What, what might be some of the practices you've explored? Yeah, I wouldn't first kind of 
uh, make sure that everyone knows that we don't put anyone's identity or work into the database without their consent. So even if you offer uh, were to enter someone else's uh, information, we would then contact that composer to ask them if they want to be included in our database. So um, moving forward, if someone does identify as a member or part of the LGBTQIA2S plus community, then they are able to say if they would like to be uh, represented or tagged as, as such within the database. And then end users can go. And while you can't necessarily search for an LGBTQIA2S plus composer um, within the database, because we want to dissuade ideas of tokenism and just checking off boxes from the people who use the database. Um, whenever that person's card does come up, maybe from another search, then their information might be on there. So it's, so there are, there are things within the database that are searchable. There are categories that you can search. And then there are some categories and things that just show up as you find the composer, but you can't always search by every single part of someone's identity. That's great. Thank you so much for that, Siad. Um, Darrell, I wondered if you um, if if you might comment a little about um, the challenges surrounding maybe more administrative leadership in the opera world and diversification. And what do you most frequently hear in terms of why we're not farther along? Yeah, that's a really good question. And in fact. <laughs> Ironically enough, I just um, earlier this morning sent a long email to a colleague in the field who sent out a posting for a senior management position. And we posted in our, our group as we do with most of those that come to us. And there are dozens and dozens of comments saying, well, you are specifically reaching out to black candidates and you're asking for six to eight years of experience in senior management and operations or production. And we have not had that opportunity. You know, can you name me a company that for the last eight years has been, you know, intentional about hiring BIPOC folks in those positions? You know, like what kind of strategic ways can we bring people into the space to get that experience or understand that they have that experience that just might look differently on the page than what you're used to? How do you educate yourself? And so that's, that's a really big challenge because if you don't have people in those spaces, who have the requisite understanding of EDI and how that system building works, then you can't get the people who know those materials into that space. And so it, it, you know, it's just a cyclical thing that happens. And so that's why organizations like the one I represent are so important because we can intervene. You know, there are general directors who are writing to me personally who are asking us you know, directly to post on our page asking, you know, and I got a very lovely email back from this colleague saying, wow, like, thank you for these articles. Thank you for this perspective, you know, and, and likely sh she's going to change the way that posting looks. She has several other postings throughout this month that she's going to be um, doing, and they're going to look different in a way that is just the slightest bit more inclusive. And I think the more and more we can do that, the more we can counteract this notion that, you know, that people of color Black folks, indigenous folks, other folks are not in these positions of power because they have not been in the industry. They have not been, you know, accomplishing the same things that their white counterparts have accomplished. It's just that we have a very white supremacist frame on how we view things. And we think that because it, it's so insidious that that is that it's correct. And in fact, diversity is, is so huge and it's so beautiful. And we just have to teach ourselves what it looks like. Awesome. So in many ways, your project and the work of your organization is also a resource, a free, a standalone resource too, and a conduit. So um, in, in many ways, the Venture Fund amplifies the information that's there, the resources Absolutely. that are there, but, but giving it under a construct where it's empowered and made apparent and available to the industry so that we can, um, so we can all work together really. Um, very much. Lara, the next question is for you, kind of maybe to talk a little um, more about the big picture, kind of the, the transformative power, the aspirational power of that you see behind Rising Sun. 
Yeah, and I, I would love to say too, it's not just my my project. I think that um, this year has been a lot of things, mm -hmm. but it has certainly been a time when we've all been thinking about change, so aware of change that is needed, um, so desirous to see it happen. And I think that the really beautiful thing about this fund and, and these opportunities, change needs to happen on so many levels. And, you know, we're, we're talking about, make, about encouraging change at administrative levels, at institutional levels. I think we all also just have this power within us to make change. And, and the smallest things can be transformative. And I think, you know, this, this support has really made me aware of that, the, the smallest things that aggregate into big things. You know, you hear one new piece of music on your local radio station and it changes how you feel that day and it changes a name that you know and it sparks something. And I think that just for me to stay connected to that, that these little things that we put out into the world just so quickly amplify themselves and connect with everyone else's transformative endeavors. And I think that if we all kind of harness the power of this moment for good, it's a lot of things, a lot of change gonna come. Absolutely. I think in many ways, summed up in one sentence, if SVF was, if the Sphinx Venture Fund was successful, it would shift, um, it would shift and catapult the field into a new normal when these conversations don't have to be sudden, sensational, um, unusual, innovative, when they just are. And these are the conversations that we're having when this business is not just a business of BIPOC composers, BIPOC administrators, BIPOC artists, when this becomes the business of every ally, every person with every type of privilege, a person without a privilege, and where we, when the narrative is our common communal narrative. And one thing that the Venture Fund does is it recognizes we need to change um, really the investment piece and we need to encourage that creative thought because at the moment, this is still new. And we also recognize Sphinx can't do this work alone. This work needs to be done by artists and leaders. It needs to be done by everyone who's registered for this conference because that it, the work is so much stronger, so much more lasting, sustainable, and ultimately effective if we do it together. Um, so in terms of kind of in the last seconds, what to do, the Sphinx Venture Fund has a page. Um, it's got a website, it's got FAQs. It has a wonderful deadline of September 30th in terms of um, applications. It also, uh, in a nifty way, has an email address um, to which you can post questions which are not otherwise answered in FAQs. Um, I say that with a bit of a smile in that I think there's a lot of information on the website directly. Um, if, if something isn't answered, please do drop a line. It's svf at sphinxmusic.org. Um, please also know that there is an artistic committee that adjudicates and looks at, looks at every single application. Um, there is no such time as too early to submit an application. Uh, there is such a thing as too late. We don't look at late applications. So certainly the world is your oyster. There is so much innovation to be done to keep in mind that we're looking for big audacious ideas. We are not looking for expansions of existing um, somewhat proven concepts. We are looking for something new, new constructs, something that has scale and breadth. Um, and something that at its heart has DEI and particularly representation on stage, off stage in every facet of our industry. Um, so we look forward to another plethora of incredible applications, looking forward to seeing how these projects will come to light and offer lessons and collaboration and opportunities for all of us. Um, thank you for tuning in. Thank you for these artists and leaders for joining us and for pioneering these ideas and really walking the walk. Uh, we are all learning from and with you, and we're inspired by your innovation. Thank you so much. Once again. Thank you.